last week's class again when we finish. You have two nails on the class we just did. So they're double, you know, all the pages are double sided when possible. So over there. And what we've been studying about in Sunday school is we're doing a series called Pentecostal Powerhouse. And we're looking at how can we become a Pentecostal powerhouse. We are comparing it to the individual who goes to the gym every week, every day, and is constantly getting in shape. If they want to develop large arms and large muscles, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes work. It takes consistency. It's something that they do on a regular basis. And if we are going to become Pentecostal powerhouses or strong spiritually, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen. We're not going to receive million dollar answers for 10 cent prayers. But it's a constant effort on a daily basis. Constantly reading our Bible every day. Doing our devotions every day. Talking to God every single day. We began talking about faith and how faith is key with everything that we're about to study because everybody has faith. Everybody, even the atheist, atheist has faith. They have, have faith that there is no God. They have faith that everything came from nothing in a big bang. They have faith in evolution. Just their faith is in the wrong location. When we look at faith and we talk about our faith as Christians, does anybody remember what the enemy of faith is? Satan. Well, doubt. I mean, Satan is our enemy, but when it comes to faith, doubt is the enemy. We go back to the account where Jesus just came out of the wilderness from his 40 days and 40 night fasting. And the disciples are standing there and they're trying to cast down a demon. And they can't do it. And many times we jump ahead in this passage and we use it in spiritual warfare and say, well, the reason it didn't come out is Jesus told him, this kind come not out but by prayer and fasting. Mm -hmm. But before Jesus gave that instruction, he told them specifically, the reason the devil didn't come out is because you doubt it. Mm -hmm. That was the very first location Jesus went. He said, it didn't come out because you doubt it. So doubt is the enemy of faith. And we moved on to the importance of prayer. And how prayer is the most unutilized weapon in the Christian arsenal. Yeah. We talk about Mary Queen of Scots who made the statement that she feared the prayers of John Knox more than all the armies in England. Mm. Then we talk about coupling prayer with fasting. And even though it doesn't state it in that phrase I just quoted, why would Mary Queen of Scots fear the prayers of John Knox more than all the armies in um, England? Because I'm sure he fasted in there. He coupled it with fasting. We talked about Elijah or Mount Carmel. How he brought down the fire of God with like a 63 word prayer. That didn't happen through just prayer. That was a man who knew what it was to seek the face of God. A man who knew what it was to pray. A man who knew what it was to fast. We moved on to looking at the armor. And we talked about the belt of truth. And there are lots of truth in this world. But the belt is the thing that pulls our armor together. In ancient warfare, if your belt was too loose, well, then your whole armor was loose. It helped keep everything secure. It helped keep everything firm. It helped keep it in place. And we are living in a society where truth is very relevant, even in the church. It is no longer completely founded on the Word of God. If we are going to become strong spiritually, we need to make sure that we know where our truth is. And even if we take man's opinion, if it does not line up with the Word of God, it is not pure truth. It is polluted. And we all know that that is one of the tricks of the enemy, is to pollute the Word of God. To make it sound good, but it's not quite right. Last week we began talking about the breastplate of righteousness. And when we look at the armor of God, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 14, well, let me go back a second. What does Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11 say? You 
You want to go ahead and reverse the file too, please, brother? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this, of this world, against spiritual wickedness and high places. So that's why we are to put on the armor. And how much of the armor did God instruct us to put on? The whole armor. The whole armor. I mean, growing up, the belt alone might have been a mighty weapon in your dad's arsenal. You can re still remember the sound of it coming through the flutes. But for the Christian, God instructed us to put on the whole armor. When we start talking about the armor of God, how many enemies do we have? A lot. We have a lot. More than we could ever count. All we know is it was one third of heaven. That's the closest we can come to with a figure. And sometimes we might be facing one enemy. Mm -hmm. one, sometimes we might be facing two enemies. Sometimes we might be facing a whole lot more than that. Yes. And they are coming from every side. Oh, and to have us protection maybe just on the front is fine, but that's not going to stop us from getting hit in the back. Mm -hmm. So God instructs us not only to put on the belt of truth to hold everything together, mm -hmm. but he told us to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Right. We talked about the breastplate last week. There were two pieces to it, and it covered the front, and it covered the back. The breastplate covered all the vital organs, well, most of the vital organs in the body. The heart, the liver, the lungs. Essential members that we need to survive. And it is designed to protect those things. We talked about what is our breastplate composed of? What... What does the Bible say that our breastplate is made of? Jewels. Righteousness. <laughs> it is made of righteousness. Yes. And when we look at righteousness, whose righteousness is our breastplate made, composed of? God. It is made of God. Because our righteousness is as filthy rags. It is of no avail. We read the account of Zechariah chapter 3 last week with the high priest Joshua standing before God and the adversary there trying to accuse him. And when he was standing there, he was in filthy rags. But God came and gave him a new garment. That is what we call the imputation of righteousness or the putting on of righteousness. It is a gift from God that cannot be or earned or obtained through works. Why is that? Because we know according to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, that faith is not of works, lest any man should boast. So this righteousness is God's righteousness. And there's nothing we can do to earn it. It is a free gift and it is given to us at salvation. And it is a legal act because there is coming a day when we will stand before the judge of the universe. And this is a legal act that says that all our sins have been pushed off. All our filthy deeds have been pushed off. All our filthy garments have been taken away. And when we stand before the Almighty Judge on that day, the only thing he will see is the righteousness of his very Son. If we are bought with the Lamb of God and we have kept our garments because we know that God is looking for our church without spot and without wrinkle, And it is our responsibility to make sure our garments are kept pure. Yes. Now, the righteousness of the individual's <coughs> breastplate is dependent upon the individual's relationship with Jesus Christ because that's the only way we keep our righteousness that has been handed down to us from God pure, without spot, and without wrinkle. Amen. When we start trying to do things on our own, Amen. then we start taking on those old, filthy garments again. Amen. We start doing, trying to do it by works. We no longer have a relationship with the God of this universe and if we're not careful and we keep going that route, there's going to come a day that we find ourselves saying, God, have we not done this? Have we not done that? And he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Amen. It is only the righteousness of God that can be accepted when we stand before him on that day. Amen. Because our righteousness is flawed. And when we look at this, we talked about last week how it is the protection for our organs. Most specifically, the believer's heart. Because we know according to the word of God that our hearts are deceitfully wicked and who can know it? 
but God can know it. Yeah. And we know, according to Jeremiah, that the heart in itself is an evil instrument of wicked destruction. If someone would please read Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9. And someone else gets Psalm 51.10 and just hold Psalm 51.10. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9. Thus saith the Lord unto me, Go and stand in the gate of the children of the people, whereby by the king of Judah comes in, and by the which they go out, and in all the gates of Jerusalem. So the heart in itself is deceitfully wicked. And wicked destruction is full of destruction. We find that David is crying out in Psalms 51 and verse 10. What's he crying out there? Create in me a new heart of God and renew a right spirit with me, within me. Can anyone tell me what just happened? Why is David writing this psalm? What just happened? Or I shouldn't say what just happened, but what is the cause of him writing this off? Go ahead, brother. Prayer for cleansing. It's a prayer for cleansing because of what he did with Bathsheba. You know, the heart is deceitfully wicked, and no one can know it. But sometimes the desires of our hearts aren't God's desires at all. We talked about last week how... <coughs> A person claimed, well, I was listening to a preacher and she heard somebody say it once, well, trying to explain the reason that he was going to divorce his wife and how they got married when they were both in sin and how she wasn't God's will for him and this person really, really was. But what does the Word of God say? When you're married, you're one flesh. Yeah. As the one uh, Bible teacher I had in Bible school, just remember, when you say, I do, you just did. Yeah. He was trying to make an excuse for what he wanted to do, which was sin. He wanted to say, well, that wasn't God's will, and this was. Now, there are some times that we want things that are not godly at all. And we want things that God does not, want to, does not approve of. Why? Because we still have an old carnal flesh that is constantly fighting and warring with us, and we will have that warring with us up until the day that we die. All because of the sin that Adam committed in the garden when he partook that fruit and disobeyed God. We know that that's been handed down from generation to generation to generation because of the curse of Adam. But David knew that his desire did not line up with God's desire. It was sin. And he tried to make excuse of it. Remember Nathan the prophet came and confronted him about it? About a shepherd who had a hundred sheep? But one of his neighbor that only had one sheep, Nathan said, you're guilty. God finds you guilty. And David had to repent. He realized that his desires did not always line up with God's desires. Amen. And it's important for us to cry out on a daily basis, God, take away the desires of my heart and give me the desires of your heart. Why? Do we know our heart inside and out? The Bible says that our heart is deceitfully wicked. And who can know it? God is the only one that can know it. Which means there's only one person in this entire universe that can reveal your true heart's desires to you. And it's not you. And it's not me. It's only God. And that is what David's crying out. Create in me a clean heart of God and renew a right spirit within me. When we look throughout the Word of God, when it comes to salvation, God tells us the importance of taking out the old stony heart and replacing it with a heart of flesh. One that's moldable, one that's pliable, one that can be changed according to His will. Ever try to change stone? You can't change stone. You can chisel away at it, you can chop away at it, you can break it. But if you take something that's fleshly, you can mold it, you can shape it, you can cut a little bit off here. It's pliable. That is the kind of heart that we need. Something that we is pliable in the God, hand of God. Because when it comes down to it, it doesn't matter what 
the most popular televangelist tells you. It doesn't matter what the most read out your commentary tells you. When it comes to Judgment Day, there is only one truth by which we will be judged. And that is the Word of God. And there are things in the Word of God that I don't understand. There are things in the Word of God that you won't understand. There are things in there that we will never understand until we get to heaven. Until we are changed. No one can sit down and describe in full detail the Trinity and how it works. No one can sit down in full detail and pull apart and put together and describe together how Jesus Christ could be 100% God, but yet 100% man. No one can describe that to a T. There is only one discerner of parts, and that is God. And if we look throughout the Word of God, we do get to see God's heartbeat, though. We do get to see what He seeks and longs after. Because when we look at Jesus Christ and the whole reason He came, the whole reason He came was not to form a group of Christians. It wasn't to form a group of 12 apostles. It wasn't necessarily to take the stripes upon His back for our healing. Throughout the Word of God, there is only one reason that Jesus Christ came. And that is to fulfill the heartbeat of God. The Son of God came to seek and to save that which is lost. That is the heartbeat of God. And if we would allow God to take out our own heart and implant His own heart into us, how much more could we do for him? How much more effective would we be? And the more that we get the heart of God, the more the devil's going to be working against us. And the more that he's working against us, the more we see our need for the breastplate of righteousness. Because we cannot build a church by ourselves. We can only build it through the power of the Holy Ghost. I can come and go down on Main Street and tell people about Christ. I can tell them how to get saved. I can show them verses. But unless the Holy Spirit works on them and draws them, mm -hmm. it's going to be null and void. Yes. Am I commanded to do that? Are you commanded to do that? Absolutely. The yes. God told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Yes. But when we get down to the dynamics of things, it doesn't matter how eloquent of a speaker you or I are, mm -hmm. or I am, it doesn't matter if we have our words perfectly in a row. If we can go through a procedure by step by step by step and have it perfect without flaw. doesn't matter what we say and do. There's still only one that can, can convert the soul. That can take out the old stony heart and put in a new fleshly heart. And that is the Holy Ghost. Now as we move on, we're going to talk about the sandals of serenity. What does Roman, if someone would like to read Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, Romans 5, 1, and someone else read Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15, Ephesians 6 and 15. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. What about Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 15? And your feet shine with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. As we're looking at the armor, Paul's doing something that a lot of preachers do, except for we use Paul in illustrations. But he's referring back to something that the common people in their flesh can refer to, can visualize, can know what he's talking about. And he's doing that with the armor. He's referring back to the Roman armor that they saw every single day or on a daily basis. They were familiar with it. They knew what it looked like. And when we look at the church there at Ephesus, it's not like they were familiar with the ways of the Jews. Because he's talking to the Gentiles. So he's reaching down to their level to show them spiritual truth. And when we look at the Roman sandals, 
They were special sandals that were military, and they were known as polygne. And they were constructed out of leather. And when we look at them, in our mind's eyes, to give us a picture of them, they're more like cleats. They had nails, pounding to the bottom. They had metal chunks down there. And the whole reason for it was they were to grip the ground. That way, when an enemy came to push against you, you could hold your ground firmly. If you were running towards an enemy, you could grip the ground and keep going and push off. It was to make sure that you were most unmovable when necessary, but yet you had footing, strong, firm footing when you were fighting the enemy. Some were made of brass. Some were made of metal. Some had hobnails under, on the bottoms to grip the ground. But keep in mind, these nails could also be used as a weapon. If somebody came running towards you, you could also lift up your foot and hit them in the leg if it was exposed. Or the arm. You could use these sandals for weapons. Many of them are described as having ankle supports to help the Roman soldier to maintain his ground. They are known for having brass shields to protect the uh, shins and the ankles. Why? Because when the enemy's coming against you, if he slices your ankle and loses that tendon, you have nothing to stand on. It was to make sure that your footing was as firm as possible. And when we look at the Roman soldier, anyone who's going to, into war, they want to make sure that they're going to win. They're going to want to make sure that they survive. They want to make sure that they come home. And they want to make sure that they come home with all their members and pieces intact. Nothing missing. And I'm sure they didn't want to get hurt in the process. They wanted to make sure that they were protected. When we look at their footwear, at the footwear, it is important for the believer to have proper footwear in battle. If you go into the store, you're going to see all different kinds of shoes. Some for walking, some for running. Why? Because it is important to have proper footwear. But we are in a battle. And it never really ceases. The enemy is always out to get us because he knows his, his time is short. So we must make sure that we have proper footwear. footwear. And Paul instructs us to put on the sandals that are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. No, it is, it is crucial that we make sure that peace is part of our Christian walk. That we know what true peace is. You know, one of the first things the devil's going to do? He's going to start attacking your peace. Because as long as you have a peace about everything, you feel fine. And you're going forward. And you can push off. You can dig into the ground when the enemy comes. You're not going to be swayed from one side to the other. Because you have a peace, you have an assurance, you know what is going on, you know where your peace lies. Jesus. Absolutely, brother, in Jesus. And we need to make sure that we can stand our ground when the enemy comes. And as long as we have that peace, we can have a firm footing. And as Brother Eli already stated, he knows where our firm footing is. It is on Jesus Christ. He is that solid foundation. He is the chief cornerstone of the church. He is that piece of stone that which all the building rests upon, that the weight rests upon. If there was a weak cornerstone or if it was out of place, the building would crumble. But Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. It was properly put in place. And because of that, when we place our feet on the solid rock, which is Jesus Christ, we have a footing that cannot be moved unless we allow the enemy to move it. And how can we allow the enemy to make sure that our footing is shakeable and not sturdy? By allowing him to remove our peace. You know, there's an old Pentecostal song, I'm taking back what the enemy stole from me. The enemy didn't steal anything from anybody. If he has anything of yours, it's because you allowed him to take it. 
Yes, he might have came in, he might have planted thoughts, he might have tried to take that peace away, made you unsure of some things. But in doing so, you loosened your grip and you allowed him to take it. Our footing is firm and it is unmovable on the solid rock of Jesus Christ unless we allow our position to be compromised. And when we look at the, God, the feet, our feet and our shoes, notice it said they're shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What is preparation? It is work. It is something that we do maybe on the side. Something we do to get ready. What are we to do before we get peace? Well, the preparation of the gospel of peace and the word of God are those that prepare themselves to take the gospel message as instructed in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, which is, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's not just the pastor's responsibility. It's not just the Sunday school teacher. It is every single last one of us. We are responsible to take the gospel message to those who have not heard it. How do we prepare excuse me, to take the gospel message to those who have not heard it? Before we can take the gospel message, we need to make sure that we are solid in the gospel message. And we cannot just take the Bible at face value. I don't mean that, that we can interpret it any which way. But sometimes we need to study things out to make sure that it is solidified in our mind. And the Word of God instructs us to do so. Exactly. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. What does that state? Second Timothy chapter three verse sixteen. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It is profitable for instruction in righteousness. And we need to study it, study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And when we study, we need to couple it with prayer. Because if we do not, if we just take the Word of God and we never couple it with prayer, then we get head knowledge, but we never get a heart knowledge. And the person who does not have heart knowledge does not have a real relationship with the person who wrote this book, with the author of it. And if we only have head knowledge, we can only do so much. We can quote off every single scripture in the Bible. We can quote it backwards. We can quote it forwards. We can know exactly where to go to without looking it up or searching. And we can know how to lead others to Christ. We can have studied every single evangelism book out there. But if we do not have a heart knowledge, we come back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Faith without works is dead. What am I implying? The Holy Ghost is the one who converts the soul. He is the one who brings the individual to Christ. He is the one that convicts <coughs> them and tells them that they are doing wrong. We can show them in the Word of God all we want, but if we do not have a relationship with God, we do not have the anointing of God, and if we do not have the anointing that goes with us, we can show them all we want to our blue in the face. Could God use that? He could. But 